Um, welcome everyone to this wonderful event entitled Democracy in Latin America and the Caribbean, Unpacking Emerging Trends in the 2022 Economist Intelligence Unit Democracy Index. Um, I'm Guy Mantel, I'm president of Global Americans. And for those who don't know, uh, Global Americans is a think tank here in Washington, DC that focuses on Western Hemisphere foreign policy with a particular focus on democracy, development, and human rights. We have programs all throughout the hemisphere and are publishing daily on these issues uh, at theglobalamericans.org. So if you find this or our other conversations of interest, um, I would encourage you to find us there or across our social media platforms at the username Global Americans. Um, so I wanna start by thanking our wonderful panel for being with us today to have the sort of hook of the recently released 2022 Economist Intelligence Unit Democracy Index as an opportunity to reflect on uh, current democratic and anti-democratic trends in our hemisphere and to collectively spend the next hour or so um, discussing what challenges, opportunities, uh, and possible policy prescriptions we might have for Latin America, the Caribbean, and beyond. Um, so I want to start by briefly doing introductions, and then we'll, we'll dive into all of that. Um, I do want to note before we begin that we'll be closely monitoring the, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen uh, for questions. So we do invite you to contact us in that way if you do have questions. Um, the run of show here is uh, Nico will open with a brief summary of the EIU's Democracy Index findings for 2022. Uh, and then we'll transition into a panel discussion on a number of topics and countries with uh, this world-class panel that we have with us today. Um, so I'll start with introductions again, and then Nico, after I go through everybody, uh, I'll turn it over to you for, for your presentation. Um, so Nico Saldias is a country analyst in the Economist Intelligence Unit's Latin America and Caribbean team. Um, specifically, Nico acts as the regional lead for the EIU's Democracy Index, and he's responsible for analyzing and forecasting political, policy, and economic trends in Peru, Chile, and Uruguay in particular. Uh, previously, Nico served as a senior research fellow at the Latin American Program and the Argentina Project at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Um, Sarah Kanojan is a journalist for Reuters covering Mexico and Central America. Prior to her most recent posting, Sarah reported extensively on Venezuela, uh, specializing in security, human rights, and U.S. foreign policy. She's covered a wide range of topics throughout her career, uh, including Nicaraguan street protests, migration from Central America, uh, land defenders on the Caribbean coast, and trans rights in Central America. Sarah's also worked as a program officer for WOLA's Cuba and regional security policy programs, and as a lead researcher on Latin America at the Center for International Policy. Uh, Ambassador John Feely is the executive director for the Center for Media Integrity of the Americas, uh, and he formerly served as U.S. Ambassador to Panama, Deputy Chief of Mission and Charge in Mexico, and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs in the U.S. Department of State. As Deputy Executive Secretary, Ambassador Feely worked on the staffs of Secretaries of State Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice, in addition to serving in other Latin American assignments, both in Washington and at embassies throughout the region. Uh, Arturo Porzekanski is a research fellow at American University Center for Latin American and Latino Studies and a global fellow with the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. From 2005 to 2021, Arturo was a professor of international economics at American University. And before that, he worked on Wall Street for nearly three decades, uh, starting first as an international economist at JP Morgan and ending as chief emerging markets economist with ABN EMRA. In 2020, the White House appointed Arturo to the President's Advisory Commission on Hispanic Prosperity. Um, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Nico, and then again, we'll, we'll have what is hopefully a, a relatively seamless transition into our panel. Thank you so much, Guy. I'm just going to uh, share my screen so you can see my presentation. Um, let me just prepare it. Oh, yes. Okay. So thank you again, Global Americans, for inviting me to give this talk today, and I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion. Uh, so the presentation is titled Democracy in Latin America, Democratic Stagnation Amid Global Conflicts. Um, so I want to begin very briefly about what the EIU's Democracy Index is. So the Democracy Index describes the state of the globe of democracy all over the world. We measure 167 countries um, and microstates are included, excluded. Um, and what is important about this index is that it's uh, it's been continuous since 2006. 
And it allows us to do comparisons um, using standardized questions and data um, that allows us to compare democracy across countries and in regions, and also very importantly, over time. So that's the advantage of this um, particular index. So very briefly, what are we actually measuring in the index? So the index uh, has 60 questions and they're in five different categories. And these five categories are electoral process and pluralism, the functioning of government, political participation, political culture, and civil liberties. And <clears throat> the scores are um, summed up in a simple average of the five categories, um, which gives us the final score for each country. And finally, how do we rank and classify our countries? So based on the score, the final score that the country gets based on the five um, variables that we discussed earlier, all countries in the world are categorized into four different uh, categories. The first one being a full democracy. That is a country that has free and fair elections, has strong level, high levels of political participation, a strong political culture, a well-functioning government, and also um, very high levels of protection for civil liberties. Then you have a category that we call flawed democracies. These countries generally have um, free and fair elections, but they tend to be weaker on all the other scores and, or some of the other scores. Um, so political participation may be lower, political culture scores may be lower, civil liberties may not be as protected as they otherwise should be, um, and the functioning of government often is not as high as I think citizens would want it to, to be. But nevertheless, these are democracies that um, are close to as, as possible to a full democracy as you can get. Then you have these two other categories. You have hybrid regimes and authoritarian regimes. So a hybrid regime is a regime that has elements of democracy and also elements of authoritarian regimes. So this is a understood kind of as a transitional regime type. And so these countries may have, you know, elections, but the playing field may be tilted in favor of the incumbent government. Uh, civil liberties may exist, but un very unevenly. Political participation may be high, but in negative ways, for example, you know, high levels of political polarization. Political culture scores are generally low. Um, but these are not full on authoritarian regimes because generally speaking, uh, changing government is at least conceivable in these government, in, in these countries, sorry. And then finally you have authoritarian regimes. These regimes are just your classic dictatorships where you don't have free and fair elections, where civil liberties are not protected, where political culture scores are generally quite low. The functioning of government is also quite low, um, but not always, you know, there are exceptions like to that, which would be like China, for example. Um, so these countries are what we would just consider a typical dictatorship. So these are the four broad categories that all 167 countries that we measure fall into. So this is the result for the global results of the democracy index in 2022. And the takeaway here is that only 8% of the world's population lives in a full democracy. And as you can see, the distribution of full democracies is generally located in North America, Canada, Western Europe has the bulk of the world's full democracies, and you have outposts of full democracy, which would be, for example, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Mauritius in Africa, but also in Latin America. Latin America has three full democracies, which would be Uruguay, Chile, and Costa Rica. And in Latin America, these three countries represent 4% of the total regional population, so below the global average. It's notable, and we'll talk about this in the discussion, I'm sure, that Uruguay this year actually surpassed Canada to be the most democratic country in the Americas this year. And Chile notably became a full democracy yet again this year. It, be, it, it fell into a flawed democracy last year, but it uh, became a full democracy yet again, and I'll briefly discuss that later. So just to look at the statistics of democracy globally in Latin America, so most of the world's population actually lives in hybrid or authoritarian regimes, actually 54.8% of the total population. And of those are in, and those are in 95 countries of the 167 co countries uh, measured. In Latin America and the Caribbean, 45% of the population live in 12 countries of the 24 countries measured that are either hybrid or authoritarian regimes. So relative to the globe, we're performing a little bit better. <clears throat> 
Um, at 38%, the region has a higher share of countries that have flawed democracies than the global average at 29%. Um, and the population that lives in a flawed democracy in Latin America is around 51%, which is also much higher than the global average of 37%. So owing to the region's three full democracies and the higher than average number of flawed democracies, Latin America and the Caribbean's average score is 5.79 out of a 10 point scale, which is actually higher than the global average of 5.29. So despite the erosion in the region's overall score in recent years, which I'm sure we'll talk about, it still is the world's third most democratic region behind North America and Western Europe. So briefly, I would like to just show you some interesting data from the index. Chile, Chile actually is one of the countries that saw the greatest improvements globally this year. It's the country that saw the ninth greatest improvement, as you can see in the graph. Um, and this was largely because of the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions in Chile. Um, <clears throat> this is the case, this is what we thought would happen in most countries. And we'll just, mm -hmm. I'll discuss very briefly why that didn't happen. And it was quite surprising, but Chile fit the model of what we think should have happened globally. Um, the next graph, the so next slide shows you the three countries in Latin America saw the steepest declines in their scores. And also this also stands out because they're also standing out globally. So Haiti, El Salvador, and Mexico saw significant score declines this year, yet again. All these countries also saw significant score declines last year, but it's, it has gotten even worse this year. I'm sure that the panel will discuss the, the variables behind the decline, but as everyone knows, Haiti is experiencing state collapse. Uh, El Salvador is experiencing um, a very notable um, democratic backsliding under Nayib Bukele with his anti-crime policies slipping into authoritarianism. And Mexico, AMLO's attacks on the independent institutions, including the Electoral Commission, um, is seriously jeopardizing Mexican democracy. Um, and also the expansion of the military's role in civil society and the government. Um, but I'm sure we'll talk about that more in the discussion. So what we thought would happen in Latin America and globally was that with the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions, we believe or we expected that the region would see scores return at least somewhat to the ex-ante position before the pandemic. But that actually didn't end up happening. And as you can see here on the map on the right, most countries score between 2022 and 2019 saw significant declines. So the redder, the greater the decline. And of course, there are some exceptions. Again, Uruguay, Chile, Guyana, uh, Suriname, Costa Rica have seen scores increase, but the rest of the region has seen scores decrease. One country that I think is worth pointing out here is Peru. Peru actually saw a very significant decline, and a lot of it was concentrated in 2022. Um, and Peru's decline followed the attempted coup by Castillo and the subsequent repression by the state of widespread protests in the country, um, which led to a significant score decline and turned Peru from a flawed democracy to a hybrid regime. Um, and there are significant risks uh, going forward for Peruvian democracy that I think we will be able to discuss in the discussion, which would be interesting for the, I think the audience as well. Um, so this is just the uh, evolution of the democracy index score since the pandemic. So on this graph, I'd like to emphasize that democratic backsliding in Latin America and, and the Caribbean um, actually predates COVID, but what COVID did is it accelerated the process, as you can see in the graph. That said, the if you were to disaggregate Latin America and the Caribbean into, into constituent subregions, so South America and then Central America and the Caribbean, you'll see that, this, that the, the region that really is pushing the overall score down is actually Central America and the Caribbean. And in particular, the three countries I articulated earlier, which is uh, Haiti, El Salvador, and Mexico. These countries are really pulling down the region's overall score. Remember, we do, are talking about a simple average, but nevertheless, you see here, which is interesting, that in South America, the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions actually did see that the South American democracy index score ticked up. But in Central America and the Caribbean, it continued its downward slide, which kept the overall Latin American score. It, it declined very, very uh, marginally this year, but it still declined yet again. Um, so I, just to emphasize what's going on in Central America and the Caribbean, 
um, with the exception of Costa Rica and Jamaica, every country in that re subregion has seen its overall score decline since 2019. And the, of the 11 countries in the subregion, six are either authoritarian or hybrid regimes, with only three being flawed democracies and one, Costa Rica, being a full democracy. So in this graph, um, I'd like to emphasize again that Latin America and the Caribbean is the world's third most democratic region. And you can see that it actually performs quite well in most categories compared to, compared to the global average. So Latin America performs well when it comes to electoral processes and pluralism. So the formal institutions of democracy are by global standards relatively firm. The functioning of government, again, is above the global average, but near it. So it, it, there is significant room for improvement there, but it is better than the global average. Political participation is also higher than the global average and civil liberties in Latin America remain higher than the global average. The one area where Latin America really struggles is political culture. It's actually below the global average. And this is really important because political culture is the base on which all formal institutions of democracy are, uh, are subsist on. And if you don't have a strong political culture, you're probably not going to have strong democratic institutions into the future. Um, so if the region is not able to address the problems of a weak political culture, which means, for example, that people don't think democracy is the best form of government, that democracy is not able to address everyday problems, it's not able to address uh, issues of crime, um, that there's a lot, lack of trust in the ability of, of democratic governments to do what they need to do, to make people's lives better, these other institutions will begin to erode. And I think we are seeing that in many countries in the region, El Salvador, Peru, Mexico, these countries have weak political culture scores. And so it's not surprising that you have a uh, democratic backsliding in these three countries, but it's also just a regional problem. Um, and I'm, I think I'll end there. Um, you can download the, Demo the democracy index here. Um, as you see on the screen. Um, and please, if you have any inquiries, you can email us as well. So thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. I look forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Nico. Um, that was extremely informative and, and a big congrats to you and your team for the report. Uh, we'll now transition into the panel and we'll start with you, Arturo, um, to start the panel on, on something of a positive note. Um, Uruguay consistently ranks among the world's top performing democracies, as Nico just told us. Uh, according to the EIU index, the most democratic country in the Americas is not Canada or the United States, but Uruguay, um, which as Nico and his team noted in their report, uh, received an 8.9 score out of 10, which is just under the Scandinavian leaders and, and New Zealand, among others. Um, Uruguay enjoys the lowest level of poverty in Latin America, and it doesn't seem to suffer from the same sort of political polarization that we are seeing in so many other parts of the region. Uh, my question to you, Arturo, is what can the region learn from Uruguay, uh, perhaps including some of the factors that I just mentioned and the ones that, that Nico just mentioned, um, and what differentiates Uruguay from the rest of the region? Thank you very much for the question and the invitation to this program. First, I should clarify that the countries that rank highest in the democracy index, Chile, Costa Rica, and Uruguay, uh, have relatively long democratic traditions, but their historical record is stained. Uh, we've all heard about Chile's Augusto Pinochet and his long regime, of course, but few know that peaceful Costa Rica had a civil war as uh, recently as 1948. And in peaceful and democratic 20th century Uruguay, there were coup d'etats in 1933, in 1942, and most recently in 1973. The early ones were short-lived, but the last one uh, lasted for a dozen years during which civilian presidents were appointed by the military, the legislature was shut down and all political activities and parties of course were banned. So I would rephrase the question as what might explain the very successful replanting of democratic roots in Uruguay since 1985? I have um, four ideas. Uh, first, I think there's an informal social contract that Uruguayans seems to seem to have made ever since uh, that, that time, uh, a tacit pact to resolve their differences at the voting booth. Uh, 
whether for elections or through referenda, instead of, say, packing masses of people into city squares to stage protests, never mind uh, tolerating trashing, looting, or burning, or worse yet, by taking up arms against the government as the Tupamaros did during the 1960s. The 180 degree conversion of Pepe Mujica from radical guerrilla leader uh, imprisoned in solitary confinement for almost a dozen years to moderate congressman, moderate senator, and then moderate president illustrates, I think, that new uh, social contract. Second, uh, Uruguay is a relatively egalitarian and homogeneous society. And these conditions tend to minimize the societal gaps, the brechas, uh, that generate conflicts. Its Gini coefficient is one of the lowest in Latin America, uh, mainly for two reasons. One, in the absence of mineral and other riches, it's not a rentier society like many others in Latin America. And thus, there's never been an oligarchy in Uruguay. Besides, and for a century now, government policies inspired by European welfare states have redistributed income from the better off to the poor. Moreover, Uruguay doesn't have an underclass of understandably resentful indigenous people because the nomadic natives were massacred or chased away two centuries ago. Third reason that occurs to me, the electoral rules, which include mandatory primaries, which are rather rare in the region, tend to encourage competition, moderation, and evolution. Uruguay had two parties which alternated in power for over 130 years, but then a leftist coalition arose and it uh, broke that duopoly, winning majorities in the legislature and the executive during the period of 2005, 2020. In some intra-party and inter-party contests have encouraged adaptation and relevancy, I think, thereby discouraging the emergence of self-imposed uh, self-impressed populist riding on a real or proverbial white horse. And fourth and last is the combination of representative with direct democracy in Uruguay, namely of regularly scheduled elections plus the options of the people, not the government, to call for a referendum to adjudicate major disputes. For example, in 1992, a referendum annulled a law that would have allowed for privatizations in Uruguay. In 2014, another failed to approve a motion to lower the age for teenagers to be tried as adults from 18 to 16 years. And just exactly a year ago, another referendum failed to overturn an omnibus law that the current administration had enacted with many modernizing reforms all at once. The availability of referenda on the top of elections, I think, has allowed for direct votes on hot issues, and thus the peaceful resolution of debates that might otherwise have led to protracted conflicts. Thanks so much, Arturo. Um, Nico, I know that you want to comment on this, but I'm going to turn it first to, to Sarah, and then we'll, we'll circle back on, on this point. Um, so Sarah, we've tasked you now with the bucket of countries that Nico described as steep score declines um, from, from a country highlighted in the EIU survey as a success story to one that has experienced some democratic backsliding over the past few years. Um, you're here with us from Mexico City. Um, two weeks ago, under the slogan, Mi Voto No Se Toca, thousands of Mexicans packed Mexico City's Ocolo Square, calling on President Lopez Obrador of Mexico to stop his plan to reform the INE. Uh, can you speak a little bit about how this sort of electoral reform might impact next year's presidential election and more generally on the state of democracy in Mexico today. Yeah, um, so it remains to be seen if Mexico's Supreme Court will end up targeting the electoral reform, but basically what it's done is cut back on employees, um, centers and AMLO's argument uh, President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador says it's to cut costs, but the critics say that 
it's really intended to tilt the next elections in favor of his party, Morena. Um, Mexico only has one term limit for presidents, but this the fear is that his handpicked successor uh, to sort of consolidate his vision for what Mexico should be um, would, would be more likely to win under these reforms. So it's uncertain exactly what that would look like, but uh, the slash to the budgets, uh, the current head of the electoral <clears throat> body says will greatly hinder vote counting um, and other electoral procedures. Um, so, and then aside from that, uh, Nicolás mentioned the militarization in Mexico, and that's been a big effort under López Obrador. He came in under a policy of hugs, not bullets, saying he put the military back in the barracks and sort of switch up Mexico's security strategy, which had been sending the military after high level uh, kingpins. But it's kind of, he's backed away from that and has really relied on the military for everything from customs to policing. Um, he really weakened the uh, state and federal police forces and has really relied on the military, uh, which hasn't had the results clearly that he has hoped because Mexico's security has gotten even worse uh, in recent years. Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, I'm going to turn it to Ambassador Feely and then Nico, I promise I'll, I'll give you the chance to respond to, uh, to, our, to his comments. Um, Ambassador Feely, According to the EIU Democracy Index, 2022 marked the region's seventh consecutive year of democratic decline. Uh, despite multiple mechanisms in place to promote democracy in the Western Hemisphere, I think we are seeing the, the proliferation of new phenomena in the hemisphere, um, some of which is undermining democracy, including waves of populism, uh, the entrenched role of organized crime and its influence on policymakers and, and also disinformation campaigns. Um, what tools do you think we need in order to take on these new challenges? And, and in your view, what can leading countries in and outside of the hemisphere do to better promote democratic movements, efforts, and causes within it? Well, first of all, Guy, let me be clear. When we say we, I am going to make these comments from the perspective of the U.S. government. Uh, obviously, there are many actors and the U.S. doesn't determine what happens unilaterally in Latin America, although there was a time when many Latin Americans actually believed that. Um, but when you look at the tools we have, they're pretty straightforward. And quite frankly, they're pretty limited. Uh, one of the shorthands that's always used in academics is DIME, D-I-M-E. So you have as instruments of national power, you have diplomatic, informational, military, and economic instruments of national power. I think it's fair to say that if you look at the last 20 years globally, the United States has erred, has made a mistake of going to the military instrument of national power uh, far too frequently. Um, I, as an ex-diplomat, obviously I'm biased, but I would, uh, I would always think that your diplomacy, you would want to be the first instrument of national power you would want to deploy anywhere. And it should be a present deployment, uh, an ongoing deployment. In the Western hemisphere, if you look back at the recent past, I think there has been a, um, a mistake made in terms of going straight to uh, one of the economic tools of national power, and that is sanctions. You'll recall that Donald Trump famously said, I'm a sanctions kind of guy. Um, he certainly proved it. And what I think we see is that these sanctions have become far more performative than they have been actually economically focused. Um, they tend to be used as castigations for people that we don't like or for businesses that we don't like um, and as punishment. In point of fact, the way they're designed, uh, sanctions are meant to change behavior. So they're meant to be used in a carrot and stick approach that is employed under an overall strategy. Uh, frankly, I don't think we do that very well in too many places. The other thing about sanctions that's universally true and everybody knows it, but nobody practices it, is that sanctions to be truly effective have to be multilateral. And the case that's always given is South Africa. 
Um, but, you know, I mean, the fact is we have had a sanctions regime with all but about a 15 month interregnum with Cuba for over half a century. And we haven't seen that change too much behavior on the island. Um, the last of the uh, the the tools, if you will, of um, of, in, of national power is diplomatic, and I think it's quite frankly the most under the one that is most underinvested in. Um, if you take a look simply at the fact that it takes any administration, this is not a partisan comment, either Democrats or Republicans, a good twelve to eighteen months to field its ambassadorial core in the region. That should give you some indication as to the dysfunction of our system in Washington when we try to deploy the diplomatic instrument of national power. I think if there's anything new that we've got to do, <clears throat> it might come in the area of, uh, of funding. Um, a lot of folks uh, will take a look, and, and this is very difficult to do in any political environment, but especially now in one that's as polarized as the United States. But if you take a look at the 2023 budget for the Western Hemisphere, and I'm talking about the U.S. government's all-in budget, this includes operations, it includes um, assistance, and our assistance is never given in sort of wads of cash to governments, it always comes in programs, it always comes with highly vetted and, you know, training, um, training evolutions, things like that. Uh, we tend, with the exception recently of COVID, we tend not to just buy tons of stuff for countries. Uh, most of it is meant to be, and it's well-developed and it is well-intentioned, but it adds up all in to $2 billion. Now, one country in the world receives a $3 billion foreign assistance allocation every year. On the 1st of January, and it goes straight into the New York Reserve Bank. That's the country of Israel. Now, this is not to say that we should not fund Israel or that it's a zero-sum game. But when you're looking at priorities and you look at budgets, and I think it is fair to assume that people put money where they think it matters most, we spend more as an American government on Israel than we do on a region of over 600 million people. So the tool that I would use that we have not is an increase in funding to invest in people. And that's really important because we don't do that very well. We tend to invest in board of director type people, tend to invest in the private sector quite a bit. Uh, we tend to look to multilateral development banks to pick up the slack um, and yet our own DFC is woefully outpricing most of the countries in the region who can't even compete because they have their per capita income is too high. So I would focus there and on a much more robust diplomatic presence to try to counteract much of the disinformation and the authoritarian rise in democratic backsliding. Thanks so much, Ambassador. I want to come back to a couple of those points in, in the next round of questions here, but I want to turn it over now to Nico. Um, Nico, I know you want to address something that, that Arturo mentioned, but I also want you to cover Peru if you can in your answer. Um, so maybe I'll start with the Peru question, and then if you want to attach the, the Uruguay piece, by all means. Um, but but on, on Peru, um, we're seeing a country, as you, know, as you noted in your presentation, that is facing widespread protests that started last December and, um, and that have led to the loss of 60 lives. Can you explain the, the series of events that led to last December's move by former President Pedro Castillo to dissolve the opposition controlled Congress, um, which of course culminated in his arrest and removal from power? Uh, and, and can you tell us a little bit about how Peruvian democracy ended up in this complex situation? Of course, Dina Boluarte is, is now the sixth president to govern Peru in the last four years. Um, so this is not entirely aberrational, uh, but can you tell us a little bit about why Peru has fallen as much as it has in your report, and then, of course, add on the piece uh, on your way. Yeah, sure. So what happened uh, with Castillo la late last year was a combination of at least um, six years of political unrest in Peru following the 2016 election. There's been a normalization of extreme brinkmanship between the executive and legislative branches. Um, as you stated, Dina Boudouarte is the sixth president. And uh, there have been at least uh, two, uh, um, no, there's been, sorry, there's been one uh, official ouster 
and resignation and a, a failed coup that led to the arrest of Castillo. So there's been a lot of things happening in Peru when it comes to presidential tenures. Um, basically, Peru has not had a full presidential uh, administration since at least 2016. And so Castillo in particular was elected in a very narrow uh, election in 2021. He won by less than I think 0.2% against his, op his opponent, which is Keiko Fujimori. And ever since the beginning of his administration, there were uh, I think baseless claims, but still claims of electoral fraud, which claimed that he was an illegitimate president. And ever since then, the opposition in Peru, emboldened by a, you know, a badly designed constitution, tried to oust him multiple times. So he was tried, the, the Congress tried to oust him at least three times. The last time was the most credible, and that was on the day of the vote unto which Congress would have uh, decided to oust him or not. Castillo wasn't willing to take the risk and decided to close down Congress preemptively. Um, Castillo was under investigation by the Attorney General for at least, I believe, six uh, criminal cases, including corruption, that were actually quite uh, credible. Um, and so uh, looking at his future, he obviously felt that things were not going in his favor, and he decided to pull the nuclear button, so to speak, and try a failed coup d'etat. He had no support. Even within his own cabinet, he failed to have support. The military didn't support him, neither the security services. And so the coup failed in a matter of hours. Um, so what you're what you see here is a combination of a number of failings of the Peruvian political system, which are, for example, a very weak political party system. Again, Castillo emerged out of nowhere, really. Uh, he was a little known figure, but he exemplified and he embodied the demands of a large portion of the Peruvian population who wanted radical reform, especially after Peru suffered so much under the pandemic. I think people may remember that Peru had one of the world's highest excess death rates during COVID. Um, and the Peruvian state clearly failed to actually address people's demands during this time. Also notably, poverty in Peru increased significantly by 10 percentage points. So clearly there was a pu public demand for change. And Castillo embodied that, but he was inexperienced. He had a political party that was also very inexperienced and also very corrupt. Um, and under Castillo, you had over 80, 80 ministerial changes. So people were very disappointed because nothing actually really happened under Castillo. What did happen was an erosion of state capacities. And this has led to the political crisis that we see today. Um, Dina Budwarte, she is a deeply unpopular president. She is seen as a continuation of Castillo's government, but also now she is seen as a, a quasi-authoritarian leader who is using um, the police forces and the military to quash uh, protests throughout the country. And as you stated, I believe up to 60 people have died in these protests. Um, and so Peruvian democracy is certainly in a severe crisis. It's unclear when the next elections are going to happen. They're supposed to be early elections. Early elections will happen probably in 2024. They could happen earlier, which is what most Peruvians want, but that will only happen if she resigns. She says she doesn't want to resign, and she says that the reason why is because things will only get worse if she does. She's not entirely wrong about that, because if she is to resign, then the president of Congress will become president of the country, and Congress is even more unpopular than she is, with an approval rating of only 6%, according to the latest e e e e uh, IEP poll. Sorry. Uh, she has an approval rating of 15%. So that gives you context of the, the, the magnitude of the, the lack of legitimacy of all the institutions of Peruvian democracy. Um, the real challenge, I think, the risk here for Peru is that its democracy index score could actually go down even further. As I stated, Peruvian parties are very weak. Um, no one knows who is a likely front runner in the next election. There is nobody who's popular. Most Peruvians say they don't want anybody who's a potential candidate. And so this actually opens the door for a Castillo-like figure to emerge again out of the ether uh, in the last couple of weeks of the campaign. And this raises the risks of a radical populist or even outright authoritarian winning in Peru. Um, and so this is something to really keep a close eye on. Um, and I think to, solve, to help solve this problem will take many years. It will require constitutional reform uh, to address these um, constitutional mechanisms that fuel polarization and fuel brinksmanship between these two branches of government. Um, so that's what, that's my quick takeaway about Peru. Uh, regarding Arturo's comments on Uruguay, everything he said was perfectly correct. I think that's right. I would just add on to it a couple of things. The first I would just say is on top of everything he said, 
the Uruguayan political parties are very deeply entrenched in Uruguayan society. Um, many people are part of the, the level of political participation in Uruguay is high. There's a large number of Uruguayans who identify with political parties and who participate actively in political parties in Uruguay, which is actually quite unique in Latin America. And these parties are, you know, some of the parties like the Partido Nacional, which is the party right now is over 100 and I think 50 years old, basically from the beginning of the, of the country. So, you know, the parties actually emerged before Uruguay in a way. Right, the identity of the parties is much deeper than the Uruguayan identity, the Uruguayan psyche. Um, and the other thing I would say here that's also quite notable about Uruguay is that the political parties are very malleable. Um, so I don't want to go into the historical details about this, but basically the political parties in Uruguay are very capable of integrating new forces within its own uh, political structures. So you see that with the Frente Amplio, for example. The Frente Amplio is a wide swath of parties on the left that includes, you know, the most radical communist party to moderate social democrats. And in the current governing coalition, you have as well moderate self like center centrist Partido Independiente with the same uh, coalition having, you know, a populist right party like the newly created Cabildo Abierto. And what this does actually is that it moderates all of these radical factions to become much more centrist over time because they have to work together to win together. So I think that's something that's very unique about Uruguay as well, is that there's this ability to integrate uh, new political forces into the political parties. There's a malleability there that I think is very important and actually tampers down the polarization we see in other countries. Thanks so much, Nico. I'm, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Ambassador Feely. Um, you mentioned the the DIME acronym and, and you issue spotted both inadequate U.S. funding alongside the issue of uh, military power being too often used. Uh, you recently co-authored a, a really great Global Americans report entitled Countering the New Autocrats Manual. So I want to give you, Ambassador Feely, um, the space to tell us a little bit more about that report, but also more broadly to talk about U.S. investment in the region as compared to China and Russia, for instance, um, who have built strategic relations throughout the region. How, how would you kind of describe these actors' role in the region compared to the U.S.'s investment or underinvestment um, and the region's willingness more broadly to engage with these actors despite their democracy and human rights record? Yeah. Um, well, th thanks very much. And thanks very much, Guy and team at Global Americans for giving us the, uh, the space there to, to publish that piece. I did that along with uh, Scott Hamilton and uh, uh, Doug Farah as co-authors. So I think when we look at Russia and China, we have to recognize that um, they are two very different actors in the region. Um, uh, let's take China first. My view is um, China is truly a strategic partner of many countries in Latin America, not just because of its trade relations, but primarily because of them. And without a doubt, China is there to stay. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the stats uh, of, uh, of, of trade figures, but it is very easily summed up uh, in the fact that uh, 25 years ago, there was not one country in Latin America that had China as its number one partner, and now uh, a number of them do, uh, if not the majority of them. Um, the thing is, however, that um, proximity uh, or familiarity breeds contempt. What I sense in my travels through the region since COVID, or since we've all learned to travel with COVID, um, is that there is a growing sense among governments that a strategic relationship with the Chinese comes with a lot of baggage. Uh, the traditional view is that uh, the Americans are pain in the neck, uh, they come to invest and you gotta answer a whole bunch of questions, they're real sticklers about um, corruption. Um, their Congress is always getting involved. Their ambassadors come and bust your chops about human rights. Uh, you know, we have to use a woke, diverse language in our reports. I mean, it's all kind of, you know, sort of, uh, ah, there's such a pain in the rear end. I'd rather go with the Chinese. That's changing. Uh, and that's obviously a bit simplistic in the calculus. But, you know, the Chinese at the beginning of the century did really show up with a lot of money on pretty easy terms. But as you've seen in other parts of the world, more than in Latin America, um, you know, the Sri Lankas and the Mozambiques and the Djiboutis, uh, the countries that 
you know, took a whole bunch of Chinese soft loans and then ended up not being able to service them. And the Chinese come in and say, well, that's okay. We'll just become part owners of whatever big honking infrastructure project we uh, we finance for you. And they end up with strategic lines of communication. They end up with things like space stations in China or in uh, Argentina uh, that Argentines aren't allowed to go near. Uh, they end up with ports in Djibouti. And, and they are actually, I believe, they are strategic in their vision. And the other thing that the Chinese have that we in the United States do not have is they have the benefit of time. You know, we think we have the, we, we have the attention span of a gnat. Uh, four years is nothing when you're talking about development. The Chinese do really think in terms of centuries. You know, they had a pretty rotten century in the 20th century, and they're banking on the 21st century to be a little bit better. The problem is that the Chinese, if you will, business culture and political culture, I believe, is really not a good fit for Latin America. Uh, Latin Americans, as Nico has, has really ably pointed out through, through all that study, have really poor political culture. But it is my observation that they don't want the Chinese political culture. They don't understand it in the first place. And that's another huge strategic advantage that the EU and the United States has in Latin America. It's just all of the soft power stuff. I mean, there are lots of underprivileged or, or lower socioeconomic Latin American kids who have gone to university in China over the last 20 years. Find me three who can actually hold a conversation in Chinese and I'll give you a prize. It's really hard. It's difficult for a Latin uh, to penetrate a Chinese culture and understand the Chinese mindset, which is why the Chinese diplomats are excellent and they've gotten a lot better. Most of them do speak excellent Spanish or Portuguese, and they do understand the cultures where they are. So they're a real force to be reckoned with, but they're still trying to sell a product that most Latin Americans see as distant and far and they'd rather just, you know, they, they, they do want to take the money. They do want the roads. They do want the sewer systems. They do want Huawei 5G, but they don't really want the Chinese as their partners. And meanwhile, where's the United States? As I said, my criticism and one of the criticisms in the article we put out there is that we've kind of taken ourselves off the field. We used to do a lot of child maternal health basic education, basic infrastructure in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. There isn't a single capital in Latin America that doesn't have a Boulevard Kennedy on it somewhere. Um, and yet, where are we now? After 1994, you could say, 1989, uh, 89 being the fall of the wall in Berlin, 94 being the celebration of the first summit of the Americas in Miami, you can, I think it is fair to say that we took our eye off the ball in terms of development of societies, and we focused more on narrow particular interests, such as combating um, narcotics trafficking and organized crime, and the support for free trade, both of which are necessary, both of which are good, neither of which even combined are sufficient to show genuine strategic engagement in the region. Final quick word about Russia. I do worry about Russia. I don't want to dismiss concerns about Russian spying and espionage centers in Mexico and in Nicaragua. But as far as a strategic partner, I think the Russians are more of an annoyance partner. The Russians will partner with whoever they can in the region, primarily the, you know, the John Bolton's famous axis of tyranny. Uh, China, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, uh, to basically put a poke a stick in the United States eye. This is Vladimir Putin and his grandiose, you know, uh, visions of being a, a world power. And so if he can do a tiny bit of, you know, power projection into the region uh, by um, supporting uh, some regimes that are, you know, in the ineluctable, but sadly too slow process of dying from within, uh, he'll do it, but that's not the same as the Chinese. Thanks so much, Ambassador Feely. I'm noticing a lot of questions and comments coming in in the, the Q&A box, and I just want to say that we'll get there in, in just a second. Um, we're going to do, uh, we'll try to finish this round of questions, and then I'll, I'll, I'll open up to the floor a bit. 
Um, and I'll go now, Sarah, to you, continuing with this trend of giving you some of the countries that have shown some democratic decline over the past year or so, um, it, actually in this case, more than the past year. And I wanna quickly take us to El Salvador. Um, since President Bukele took office in June of 2019, He's been concentrating power and undermining many democratic institutions in El Salvador. I'll give one of, of many examples here. Um, he replaced members of the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court in furtherance of his bid to seek a consecutive presidential term. How would you describe, Sarah, uh, Bukele's rise to power, and how different is his model from others we've seen in the region in recent years? Yeah, I think... I mean, in looking at both El Salvador and Mexico, I think it's important to contextualize AMLO and Bukele because it's not like the previous governments were seen as having delivered. I think that a lot of people don't see any sort of convincing opposition to them, any sort of great alternative. And both in both cases of Mexico and El Salvador, the presidents are considered to be populist and giving people what they want. Uh, in the case of AMLO, social programs, um, money essentially to people, especially in the South. And then in the case of Bukele, uh, it's been security recently. And his, secu his security policy has <laughs> definitely leaned authoritarian, uh, but it's, you know, the gangs under the previous administration uh, held a lot of power in neighborhoods. So I think that it's important to think about what people see as the alternative, what are their most immediate concerns before democracy, um, such as, you know, in the case of El Salvador, uh, security um, opportunities. Uh, so yeah, I think that it's just, it's important to consider where are people's priorities uh, on democracy. And I also think, you know, between Mexico and El Salvador, El Salvador is such a small country, it's a country of 6 million people. And so he's, Bukele has been really able to get in there and make a lot of rapid changes quickly um, because it is so centralized and a much smaller country with many fewer power brokers than in Mexico. He basically had the gangs to deal with and not really much of an opposition to even deal with. Thanks, sir. If I can maybe stay with you actually for just one second, can you speak a little bit about the risks of um, Bukele's model maybe being exported to other Central American countries that you've covered? I know that in, in December of last year, in December 2022, uh, President Castro of Honduras announced a state of exception in her country, though it was mostly in San Pedro Sula and Tegucigalpa. Uh, but, but what is the risk that you see of, of Bukele's model maybe being exported elsewhere to Central America or, or beyond? And, and kind of what would you say supporters of democracy across the region need to do to provide and promote a sort of alternative approach? Um, yeah, I mean, with regards to the state of exception, you know, there's been a lot of human rights concerns, uh, concerns about torture, um, cases of people dying in prison. And I think we, uh, you know, we recently published a piece on this, which is essentially what rights are people willing to give up to feel safe? Um, and I think you really can't, you know, when we've gone into the neighborhoods where gangs controlled before and residents, are happy. <laughs> um, and so there's this calculation going on. But I think Sarah froze. I think Sarah froze. You know, yeah, I, I'm froze. not going to finish her thought, but let me just uh, uh, offer this thought. Um, Mano Dura, which is what he's doing. Oh, is she back now? <laughs> Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah, it still looks okay. Sarah, can you hear us now? <laughs> no, Sarah, it's a, it still says you're connecting the audio. So maybe Ambassador, keep sure. your, her audio. Connected. I feel bad. I'm going to be talking right over, but these are the wonders of uh, technology. Um, oh. Manu Buda, Manu Buda. There we go. 
Sorry. Oh, okay, go ahead. Sarah's back. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, there has been examples of Monodoro, and especially in, which is, you know, a hardline security policy, but this is, and, you know, Bukele's successor also had a Monodoro policy, but this is just another level. They recently just built the biggest prison in Latin America, and he has sort of taken on this role of, yes, I am the enforcer, because it's popular with people. And Honduras is way pared down. It's not anything in comparison. And I think people are interested, other countries are interested, but so far it's just been interest. Um, but, you know, there's other countries, especially in the Caribbean, that have very high gang problems. And so people are taking a look over Bukele and saying, hey, he's popular and it looks like security is getting better. But as you mentioned, it's it's come along with an incomplete centralization of power. And it's what it's done, the state of exceptional Salvador has allowed him to increase his power even more. And it's come in conjunction with full on attacks on um, information, access to information, the press, civil society, uh, active disinformation campaigns. Um, Bukele has also built up this massive propaganda machine that I published an investigation on that consists of troll farms, digital, outlets that all kind of builds on each other to put out uh, this image of him as a strongman leader. And he really sort of takes it on proudly. And because he's so popular, uh, it's not, he sort of disregards international concerns about democratic block, uh, backsliding. I will say uh, from Global American's perspective, we, we have a multi-year study on mis- and disinformation in Latin America and the Caribbean and everything that you just said, Sarah, uh, rings true about some of the troll farms and the disinformation activities we've seen in El Salvador. Um, so so I, I completely concur with your answer. I know Ambassador Philly, you were, you were about to jump in uh, while Sarah was dealing with your tech issues. Uh, just a very quick comment on the nature of mano dura wherever in any society it is implemented. Um, it only lasts for so long until you descend into absolute totalitarian government, sort of like what you have in Cuba. Um, and one of the things I think you're going to see, and it's best expressed in an anecdote I recently heard from a Salvadoran friend um, who is from the, you know, what we used to call uh, in the 1980s, the Garks, uh, the oligarchic families who ran the place with Arena. Um, and this individual was saying to me that when Bukele came along, they didn't really like it, but boy, they liked the result. Boy, they really did. And his popularity is genuine. But the story is that this family has a 30-year cook and a 30-year chauffeur, as most families uh, who live in you know nice neighborhoods and are of the upper class do. And they were just head over heels Bukele supporters. This is great. We can go have a picnic on Saturday. We can go shopping. We don't get held up on the buses. All of the all of the instant results that come from imprisoning 2% of your adult population in a space of about 18 months. That said, one night, my friend gets a call from his, 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 uh, his cook, who's worked for the family for 30 years, and in tears, her son has been arrested. Mm -hmm. Her 16-year-old son, who was out visiting his girlfriend secretly at night in an area where he potentially broke a curfew or something, the kid is not tattooed. He is not, he doesn't look like a marero, uh, and yet he is now in jail. And oh, sir, Mr. Businessman, my friend, you have to help me. You have to help me get my kid out of jail. That kid's been gone for about four or five months now. Nobody knows where he is. They can't trace him. They don't, uh, you know, it, it, he's, and what we know is he's probably getting a PhD in, in gangland studies, and he was not, genuinely not, a Marero beforehand. That kind of story circulates in the dinner party circuits of Latin America's elite, and that's the kind of story that over time will be replicated in El Salvador, and then it becomes a question of how long will the elites, the economic elites, be willing to acquiesce to a mano dura type of scenario. Thanks so much, Ambassador. Um, Arturo, I'm going to close off the second round turning to you, but I'm also going to maybe incorporate a question from the audience as we uh, hit the hour mark here. Um, I think there's a, a, an interesting segue here in terms of 
where we started and, and now where we're ending on the second uh, round of questions, which is um, despite all of the successes that we talked about with Uruguay, it's low levels of corruptions, it's generally high democratic indicators. Um, in 2022, uh, Uruguay did see an increase of about 25% in homicides. Um, so I'm wondering if, if these sort of security questions that Sarah and Ambassador Feely just mentioned um, might test some of Uruguay's successes going forward. And then if I might, Arturo, I, I'll, I'll ask a second question, which is one from the audience, which is um, coming from Alfredo Moreno, who says, uh, given that the mission of international development banks is to promote development state and state capacity as a condition for development, how can international development banks go about building state capacity in countries that are experiencing democratic backsliding? So Arturo, I'll give you the, the opportunity to answer both or one or the other of those questions, and then we'll, we'll pose it for the rest of the group. Sure. Um, just wanted to make a couple of points uh, before then. Uh, one is uh, what Nicolás brought up, uh, the health of the political parties. I think one of the reasons why there's been democratic backsliding in so many countries and so many populists have come onto the scene is because political parties ossified. They either became irrelevant or they were viewed by the people as part of the problem and not as part of the solution. So I'm no political scientist, but I would say, tell me about the health of your country's political parties. And I'll probably be able to tell you something about how democratic or not democratic they are. So something to look for, right? What went wrong in so many countries that their political parties uh, became detested in many cases. Um, second on the security issues. Yeah, it, time was when Latin America, was merely a, a growing uh, a, a role in, 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 in narco-trafficking. It was doing the growing of right, uh, coca and so on, and then the uh, export of it. Uh, eventually, they got into the refining business. Okay, fine. But basically, it was an export-led development model, I'll call it. Uh, but uh, what has happened in, in most countries is that uh, Latin Americans have become consumers of hard drugs. It's not just marijuana. You don't solve it like in Uruguay by legalizing marijuana. Uh, so that is the big problem. And that we see even in Uruguay, people who should know better, uh, the people who were among the first to you know, ban smoking in public spaces and so on, uh, there is a, a hard drug problem. And so it's not just the trafficking for export anymore. Uh, there is a local a business to be done. And I think that's why uh, a lot of uh, security related issues have become so entrenched in many countries because it's not just a passage to the US and Europe. Uh, it's not just an export model, it's now also a domestic consumption problem. And, and so that's uh, about that. Um, on uh, the development banks, and I would say the role of governments in general, you know, if, if you are a China and you go to countries and say, I'm willing to buy all the natural resources you can export. You definitely get not only a hearing, you get a seat at the table. And that's how China became influential. It wasn't because so much their projects or their aid and so on. It was because they are now either number one or number two or number three export market for uh, certainly the resource rich countries uh, of Latin America. Uh, and, um, and so that's not something that the US government and count because we don't we don't have that kind of and it's certainly not interested in the government to go on shopping sprees in Latin America and that's where the private sector is in so American multinationals are very important European multinationals are very important they do a lot of the work that you know China doesn't do uh, they do the local markets and they provide alternative uh, investment and, and export markets and they provide capital, badly needed capital, and so on. So we haven't spoken much about the private sector uh, role, but uh, you know, it's something to consider because that also has some impact on, on democracy. As was mentioned, it's not just the US government money that when it goes in, it demands uh, high standards. It's the private sector when, from the United States and Europe when it goes in, uh, demands uh, better standards uh, and less corruption and so on and so forth. So uh, I just thought I would mention that. And with regard to the development banks, um, I'm happy to tell you, 
The IDB, the World Bank and its equivalents have been in the nation building business for a long time and have been in specifically in the institution building business for a long time. So a lot of money has not just gone, you know, for dams and roads and, and, and water and so on, but also uh, to buttress the judiciary, to improve, you know, central banks, to improve uh, other key institutions in the countries. But as uh, all nation building, in the end, it depends on, you know, the extent of local ownership. If the local people and the local elites want it, that's one thing. If they don't want it, you know, it doesn't stick. Thanks so much, Arturo. Um, we have, uh, I, I wanna see if anybody else on the panel wants to address that question on, on development banks. And if not, then I'm gonna to turn to another question. I see uh, Ambassador Feely just closed his camera, but I think both of the questions actually were directed to his comments on investing in people. Um, so I, uh, I wanna see, first of all, if anybody on the panel wants to address any questions on the international development banks, and if not, we'll transition to those questions. Okay, um, so we have a question from uh, Larry Coben and and from David Atkinson, uh, and it's funny because before we started, we talked about whether we would blur backgrounds or not, and people would see bookshelves. I've got three of David Atkinson's books behind me, so that's another benefit of uh, of not blurring backgrounds. Um, I'll do I'll do both of the questions are similar. I think both of them are addressed to points that. Um, that Ambassador Feely mentioned, but I'll, I'll pose it to the panel as a whole as he returns. Um, so David writes, uh, excellent point regarding funding directed at people, but how do you do that in a country like Bolivia, for instance, where the government regards any involvement by the U.S. as imperialistic intervention or words to that effect? And Larry Coben writes, uh, Ambassador, how would you invest in people? Again, the same sort of broad question. How would you change programs like those in USAID that have metrics that might be um, less effective? How would you change these programs to actually reach the people effectively and then move the locus from Washington consultants, he writes, to on the ground programs? Um, Ambassador, I don't know if you heard the first question. I did, yeah. No, really, thank you very much. I'm sorry I had a fire alarm go off here. Um, a, yeah, the, marvelous questions. Um, so keep in mind, the United States does not need to direct fund everything. Um, when, when we often seek to claim credit and we put the USAID logo on things, uh, very frequently it can backfire, but that's not the only mechanism for investing in people. On the other hand, when we have invested in people massively, and I'm thinking of, uh, the PEPFAR initiative, uh, we have had excellent results. Um, and why do we have them? Because it was truly a global threat. Uh, we had buy-in from uh, many, many partners around the world, and PEPFAR remains one of the most successful health-related investments in people. Um, there are those, and I am not an Africanist, um, but there are those who have claimed that it's, it, it absolutely saved the future of Africa by timely intervention. So we know we can do this stuff. Um, the, the questioner raises a great question about the USAID bureaucracy. Um, I spent almost 30 years working in the State Department. I have nothing but the highest regard for my USAID colleagues, but honest to God, I have no idea how they do it. Uh, they spend more time writing internal reports uh, than they do actually getting on the street. And when you talk to them, they will say the same thing. Now, I will say, Samantha Power uh, is very aware of this. She has spoken to this directly in public comments, and I would encourage her to keep going. So the best way that you could, uh, I think, perhaps change or modify the United States government's current business model for investing in people is precisely what the questioner suggested. Change the locus of activity move it out of D.C. and down to the chief of mission. You know, something our, 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 our listeners and our participants may not be aware of, there is something called chief of mission authority. Uh, there, it, this is a literally a, an instructional letter from the president of the United States to whoever that, that ambassador is, confirmed ambassador. They're the only ones who get it. Chargés don't get it. Um, and, and what it basically says is you are responsible for everything that occurs or does not occur under the aegis of the U.S. federal government. 
That's an enormous power. And yet I think it's fair to say that it is not, or it has, it has not been as aggressively exercised by the Department of State uh, institutionally and by individual ambassadors uh, on a, on a, on a one-off basis. There are lots of reasons for it. The rise of the interagency, uh, the proliferation of um, issues overseas that require specialists from various competing agencies, um, and the simple fact that no one individual, certainly myself included, can ever be the master of all of the details of these various subjects, from development to law enforcement to health to uh, business and finance. But you can run an effective country team. And when you get, and I think this was shown from, from the WikiLeaks scandal, when you get a country team that looks at a specific issue, like investing in people, like addressing uh, child maternal health, like addressing early education, like addressing the digital divide, all these things that I would consider in the category of investing in people, what WikiLeaks showed is you know, the U.S. government actually has a pretty good understanding of the local environment. They get where the power relationships are. They understand how things move in that society. And so that's why I would say that to better invest in Latin American populations, one, we got to pump up the jam, we got to put more money in there. And two, we need to move the locus of implementing uh, power, if you will, and authority down to the country team. Thanks so much, Ambassador. So Arturo, you raised your hand um, and, and I recognize we're also running up on time here. So maybe Arturo, we'll, we'll have you comment and then we'll, we'll quickly wrap up. Yes, I wanted to bring up again, the role of the US private sector in, uh, I think the, the, the most effective way we have improved human capital in Latin America is by uh, training people like me, people who have come to the U.S. and gone back, and uh, and you know, with their master's degrees, with their PhDs, with their you know uh, uh, other technical know-how, and uh, and they have become the better technocrats, the better you know, with their MBAs, the better company managers, and so on, that have uh, produced uh, uh, whatever good results uh, there have been. Now, tying it to the democracy thing, I think the more democratic countries are the ones that have found a good equilibrium between mixing technocrats with mixing politicians. Those countries where you have a, a somebody running for president thinking, you know, oh, I'll just hire somebody to take care of the economy and I'll work on everything else. That's not a good, uh, that's not a good prescription. The more successful countries, the more democratic countries are the ones that have integrated really well, I think, politicians with technocrats and weighing you know, the political factors with the practical realities of the world. And I think that uh, that's something that, um, that needed to be mentioned. Here. Thanks so much, Arturo. Uh, so I think with that, uh, unless anybody else has any last comments, we'll, we'll close. We've gone about 15 minutes over the time we've asked of, of our panel here. Oh, uh, Ambassador Feely, I see your hands raised. I just wanted to say I couldn't agree more with Arturo. Uh, the private sector has absolutely a critical role to play there. Keep in mind that capital is a coward. Money only flows to places where it's relatively safe. And when we start to talk about the linkage between um, safe places for money and democracies, you see a tremendous coincidence. And one of the problems that this leads to is that you can have, uh, you know, and, and I agree completely, training and educating people is the single best way to improve um, any society, both economically and in terms of its politics. But you take a look at the folks who have run many, the technocratic experts who have run many Latin American uh, um, uh, economic teams, and uh, in many cases, uh, they don't succeed. And I would argue that one of the reasons they don't succeed is because of kleptocracy and corruption. And not that they're all, all themselves reaching in and filling their own pockets with the, government, uh, the government's tax receipts or the foreign investment that flows in, 
but you can have the very best, uh, and I take I, I point to Mexico. Look at Mexico. They've had people like Augustine Karstens. They've had, I mean, you know, Alejandro Werner, who's at Georgetown now. They've had absolutely world-class MBAs with the best U.S. pedigrees. And yet take a look at how Mexicans think about politicians. They're all corrupt, throw them out, and they elect AMLO, who calls everybody a mafia de poder as long as they don't vote for him. Uh, and people are, and Mexico has one of the worst political cultures in the region, and yet they have some of the very best technocrats. So you really do have to do what Arturo said. You have to link that class of technocrats to the politicians and the political class. And if you don't do that, you're going to end up with a Mexico. Thanks so much, Ambassador. So we close on some consensus then. Um, I, I do want to close now, though, because I, I think we have abused uh, our panel's time and, and our audience's time. But this has been extremely, extremely enriching, uh, far reaching and, and really enjoyable. So on behalf of Global Americans, uh, thank you again, Arturo, Sarah, Nico, Ambassador Feely for being with us today. Um, and thank you also to everyone who joined us here for this conversation. We look forward to seeing everyone again very soon. And we look forward to the next event with you all. Thank you very much.